Okay, well, a few questions while people are still coming. Uh, who uses Git at least once a week? Well, great, majority. Second question is, uh, who wants to learn about Git internals? Uh, guys, just checking, like, if you didn't come here by mistake, so you know <laughs> what you were looking for. Um, okay, yeah, so I find uh, Git internals quite interesting, and um, I would like to share it and uh, use the Python to help me explore them. Why should we even look into Git internals, right? Mm, well, why not? is a good enough answer for me, right? But I need to convince you why it's a worthy subject of investigation. I think one of the main reasons is uh, better understanding the tool. If you know how internals work, right, it can lead to more efficient use every day and more easy understanding of stuff you read on the internet about Git. Uh, then you can learn the ideas because there are a bunch of quite interesting, innovative and creative ideas that were put into Git design and implementation. And uh, we can broaden our horizon and we can use and adopt them in our own projects. And of course, uh, healthy curiosity. I like to watch uh, on YouTube those kind of videos like how stuff works, where they explain, you know, how everyday objects work and operate. So yeah, that's kind of this talk, right? How stuff works, but in, in software world. Um, please raise your hands who think that Git is hard or at some point of like their life said, damn, Git is hard. Well, again, the majority, right? So I think the main problem why Git is hard is that because Git is largely misunderstood. Uh, this is from one of the early Git readme files. So when Linus Torvalds wrote the, way, the very first version, he described the tool as the stupid content tracker. The keyword here is stupid, right? So it implies stupid not as not smart, but stupid as, you know, simple, right? So it was designed and envisioned to be simple. Let's look at a very brief history of the first version of Git. So Linus Torvalds himself began development of Git on the 3rd of April. Year doesn't matter. It's about days. And then basically he had a working version in three days and then he started using it to host the Git source code itself in one more, in one more day. And then basically within a month he managed to achieve his performance goals, right? Is that incredible? Is it doesn't sound like a hard tool. It's something that basically one person, or I don't know, maybe he got some extra help, but it was mostly him, managed to do in one month, right? So what can be actually like hard about it, yeah? Uh, it should be simple, it was designed to be simple, but then something went wrong. So the normal ways of using tools, whether it's software or anything, machines, you know, um, devices, is that normal people first learn how to use the thing, master, you know, how to operate it, and then maybe, maybe learn internals, right? You don't really need to know how the car engine works or how transmission works internally to be able to operate cars. And most drivers don't actually know that much about the internals, right? But the Git was envisioned and designed the other way around, right? It's important to notice that the Git was created by the Uber geeks, right? Not like, uh, you know, everyday geeks, but Linux kernel developers. It was designed by Linux kernel developers for Linux kernel developers. And uh, their idea was that um, if you create simple building blocks and people learn them, like the usage will become self-evident, right? Then they basically thought that if you first learn the internals, then you will automatically understand how to use the tool. Well, and my guess, that's where the things went wrong. Something that works for Linux kernel developers doesn't maybe works for, you know, wider programming community. So that's why I think uh, it's quite useful and important to look in the Git internals. So what is Git? It is the quote of um, pro Git book that I recommend it's free official book on Git. So Git is fundamentally a content addressable file system with a version control system interface written on top of it. So it implies that there are layers, that there are layers by design. So you might be wondering what is a content addressable file system? I will skip this for a second and I'll come to it later. So uh, let's decouple uh, Git into um, layers. Um, 
so basically on the very basic layer, the git is key value store which is a content addressable. Then on, on top of this key value store is a file system built, right? And just on top of that, the version control part is built. And then on top of the version control part, the collaboration tooling is built. Uh, so speaking about comments, right, if we're talking about version control level, it is about comments like git checkout, uh, git commit, git branch, this stuff. And collaboration level is git push, pull, fetch and well working with the remote repositories. But in this talk I will speak about first two levels, right, that uh, have their own comments, have their own structure, but nobody really uses them every day directly. So um, key value store, right, the lowest level of Git. So well usually if you have a key value store, whether it's a Python dictionary or, or some database, the fundamental principle is that you can provide a key and store any arbitrary value by that key, right? So this key could be anything, right? You generate it. It doesn't necessarily need to be a part of content of the value. That's normal way. So I said that Git is content addressable um, file system or key value store. So what does it mean? Uh, it basically means that the key to the value is value itself, right? But it looks like it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So content cannot be the key of itself. It doesn't sound useful and it's not really gonna work. So what the Git designers um, created, they, they came to idea that you can use a hash of the value is its key, right? It basically means that key depends on the value and that's what content addressable part means. It is, means that you can refer to the value by its hash. And uh, well, in Git terminology, the hash is SHA and value is object. Basically, object here have nothing to do with the, uh, you know, um, object-oriented programming. Object is just uh, any thing that uh, Git stores in its um, key value store. So there are two important implications uh, here is that, um, first of all, content is immutable. Basically because if you have a file, it has certain hash, and then you change the file content, it hash changes, right? So basically key changes if uh, the content changes itself, right? It means that if other objects are linking to that uh, original file, right, once you change the content, the key changes, and the, all the links get broken. Basically, that's a very important implication, so, all the objects in Git are immutable by that sense. Uh, but there is a good news. Uh, there is no content duplication, right? If you try to store two identical things in Git key value store, there will be not two copies of the same thing, right? Because it has the same key and there is no need to store the second version because it is the same object and same version, essentially. Those are two very important implications and they affect a lot of uh, things in Git. Okay, so a small interesting fact. So basically, what is repository in Git when it comes to your file system is just this .git folder in your uh, project folder, right? All the files that you have beside the .git folder, well, basically your source code, they're actually themselves not part of a Git repository. They're called a um, working tree. And there is just a way to interact for Git with a normal file system. And uh, important fact that you can actually set up a Git repository without having a work tree at all. It's called a bare repository, and that's what is used on Git servers. Okay, now let's look what's inside this uh, Git folder. Uh, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna run a bunch of comments and then use Python to explore what actually happens inside uh, the Git repository itself. So let's uh, first... Um, create our repository. Okay, as you can see it says initialized empty git repository in .git. That's what I meant that it doesn't really include the files. So let's just go there. Um, so the storage for this key value stuff in git is located in git.git .git slash object. So let's see if there is anything in it. There's a bunch of stuff. Uh, those are directories. There are no files yet because it's empty. 
repository. Okay, so as I said, for every level in Git, there is its own uh, com a set of commands. So there is this command that will compute the hash of the object. So an object, as I said, can be any string. So let's uh, create this. Wait, let me lower my microphone a little bit. Python is cool, right? And then I'm gonna pipe it into git hash object, which hashes the object from std in. Okay, it just prints the hash, well, according to the how git calculates the hash. Well, in the best traditions of git, um, there is, if you add a flag to this comment, it will do something completely different. So if you add slash w, it will not just calculate the hash, but it will actually store the file in the key value store. Right, so with, I think that's one of the problems with Git. So a lot of comments have flags that completely change, right, what the comments do, and that's, I think that was, yeah, one of the biggest design mistakes. But let's try it. So it also prints the hash, but now it stores our object. So uh, let's uh, see what's there. I will use type files because directories don't really matter for now. Okay, now we see there is uh, one more file, and its path happens to be, well, basically a bro broken down hash of the object. It takes first two letters, and then the rest of the, uh, of the hash. So, you know, let's try to write this file again, right? So as I said, the content is immutable and deduplicated, and let's see if there are more objects appearing. Well, nope, there is no need to store this file. It's already there, because it has the same hash. So, uh, you know, let's do this. I'm gonna store one more object there. Let's say 2017 is cool, right? And now let's see if there are more objects, right? There is one more object because it's a different thing. Okay, now let's explore what are actually those objects. Uh, so I created this um, Jupyter notebook that will help us to explore the content of the Python. So here I just set up some helper functions that gonna help me to show some stuff and, you know, just type less code. And uh, yeah, let's lose, use uh, glob to, you know, iterate over all the uh, file objects. Boom, there are two objects in our Git repository. Let's create a function that will, um, you know, list all our objects because we will use it for later. And, and just see if it works. Yes, it clears up all this, you know, the, the common path of the files and it will show just them uh, basically hashes. So, um, okay, let's, let's pick the first, uh, the first path, right? And I wrote this function that reads the file, basically just outputs its um, contents in one line. Oh, okay, that uh, seems like some binary gibberish. Okay, basically the thing is that uh, git uh, zips the contents of the object, so we need to unzip it. Right, okay, now we see the content of our object. So we can see the first comes the word blob, then some number, and then zero byte, and then null byte, and then actually the content of my object. So what is this blob? Blob is a uh, object type. So git stores object types inside, well, this, its key value store, and then a content. This number is a content length, basically, how many uh, characters are there. Okay, so now we know that object has type. Um, so let's create a name tuple uh, where we, we're gonna store um, our parsed objects, which will have path, type, and, uh, and the content itself. Okay, now let's create uh, two small functions that will help us to read objects um, and you do what we use so far. So read object function basically reads the file, unzips it, and then using a regular expression it takes the type of the object and the content. We don't need length, basically. Length is just, a, you know, for informational purposes. And then let's write the function that will iterate over all our object paths and parse the objects. And let's store it in a variable. All right, I forgot to write, uh, run this part. Okay, uh, now I created this uh, small function to more easily plot uh, tables with the with, um, name tuples and some other content. So okay, we can see that there are two objects in our repository, both of them has a type blob, and we can see the content here. It's uh, one is yeah, EuroPython and another is EuroPython 17. Okay, and um, now we have some stuff in our repository. Now let's go back into something more, uh, you know, uh, 
what we do every day. Okay, so let's uh, create a file with the, and store like just the current date in it, right? Let's see what's inside. Well, nothing interesting, that's just a date. Quite predictable. So now let's add this file and uh, commit. And uh, commit is done. Now let's see what changes in our repository, right? Okay, now let's uh, get the list of objects again and, and see what's inside. Okay, there are three more objects. Uh, we can see the types. Okay, now beside the blob, now we see two more types, a tree and a commit. Uh, well, uh, commit, we're gonna it's explore it later, and tree is some sort of also binary gibberish of sorts. And then we can actually see the blob, the file that we just added as a part of our commit. As you can notice, the blobs of the files, they don't have names. They're pretty much nameless, right? So you put content itself. So basically, it, blob doesn't store the name of the file. It's important and you will see why later. Okay, so let's extract that commit object and see what's inside it. Now we can see that's actually pretty readable text, but just it's uh, separated by new lines and let's split it by new lines to see what's there. So we can see that uh, commit object is pretty much a bunch of Textual metadata, right? It has headers, right? It has a header tree, author, and committer that happens to be me, and actually the, the text, uh, the comment of the commit, right? So uh, what's interesting here is what is this tree? Because we can see the tree is points points to hash, All right? Let's create a small function that will convert a commit headers into a dictionary. We're gonna uh, use multidict. Multidict is, is just a, some third-party dictionary that can actually hold several values for the same key because those headers are not unique. Some of them can appear twice. So let's use this helper function to parse headers. Okay, now we have a dictionary of headers. Now, um, right now the most important thing here is a tree, right? It seems like a pointer in terms of it's a hash. Now let's see what is the, it points to, what kind of object it points to, and what its contents are. Uh, let's extract it from, from, from the headers. Uh, let's have this function that will you know, convert the hash into the uh, file path. Just nothing interesting. Okay, now let's, let's load this tree object and print its contents. Um, Okay, we can see that it has um, some numbers, then the file name, and then just some binary stuff. Uh, basically, what tree is, it is um, a list of objects that, you know, it contains the metadata for objects, for blobs and for other trees. So let's um, create a small function that, that's gonna retrieve uh, from our collection of objects by hash. So we don't have to type this again because we'll use it later. And now let's parse this tree file. Uh, we can, again, we'll use regular expressions. Actually, quite cool that you can use regular expressions for binary files as well. It's actually quite easy way to parse binary files. So this tree object consists of um, entries, which are defined as then first there comes a bunch of numbers, which actually happen to represent the Unix permission bytes. Well, we don't really care about them. Then goes the file path, right? It can contain letters and dots and slashes. And then there is a hash of the file that it refers to in binary format, right? That's why there are 20 uh, bytes, because in hexadecimal format, it's 40 bytes of the SHA. Okay, uh, now, now let's try this parse tree function and see what it's gonna output. Okay, now that's something we can read. Now we see that a tree con consists of only one file and it's pointer. So basically a tree is something that contains metadata for, for uh, other objects. And uh, basically tree connects the blob with the name of the file that it actually corresponds to. So you can see it's D2 something, right? And where was it? Here, right, D2. So it points to this object. Okay, now that's how pretty much Git implements file system by this tree objects. Um, 
Okay, now let's do more stuff with our repository. Uh, let's do a, create a directory called uh, new deer, and then let's uh, just do the same stuff. Let's just, you know, um, just write the date to the file. Now let's gonna add this file and commit. And now let's see what kind of objects appear in our repo after this. Use the same function and uh, show it as a table. Okay, well, there are more stuff. It's already a little bit hard to, you know, keep track of it visually. So now let's um, start to learn what are actually branches in Git. There are also the general term for branches is a ref or reference, and they live in this. Uh, and this path, it's .git slash ref slash heads. And we have only one branch, and it's master. So basically what um, a branch is in Git, right, it's just a file that just points to hash of the current commit, right? So we can actually go and see what, we, what do we have in our ref. Boom, it's just a hash of the latest commit. So it's important distinction. So branches in Git are not objects. They are just merely a pointers with a name to a commit. And because they are not objects, they are actually mutable, unlike the objects themselves. Uh, okay, now let's extract this, uh, the, the hash, the pointer, and just you know strip, strip it from all these extra bytes and stuff. Okay, that's it. Let's try to find the commit object that master points to, and let's look inside its contents. Let's look inside its headers. Okay, that's where master points it. So commit object uh, has the tree that we learned previously, but now it has a new field, a parent, right? The first commit didn't have a parent, obviously, because it was first commit. So basically, the parent points to previous commit in this line. Okay, let's uh, convert this three lines of code into function because we might use it later. Okay, now let's look at the tree, the latest tree of the latest commit. Okay, now we see beside the file.txt, it also contains pointer to a new directory and it's a hash. So basically, it's just sort of a representation of the file system just inside the git. And uh, now let's, uh, you know, uh, let's compare it with the parents. Um, okay, now let's do this. Let's add one more. Uh, let's um, make one more deer. Let's say make newer deer. Now, oh. and let's do the same trick. Let's just write some. Uh, More file. Let's just write the date. Git add. More. Okay. Now let's see what. Let's see what. Uh, what did we add there? Okay. Let's uh, check again. Wow. The list of objects keep growing, growing, growing. Let's read master again. Let's, well, it's not necessary. And then, okay, let's see the master's tree. Okay, now it has three entries. Well, that's interesting. Okay, and now let's compare it with the previous, its parents tree. And it has, the previous had two um, entries because, well, I just added this new one. So what we can see here that the file.txt was not changed in the latest commit, right? And since it wasn't changed, it is the same content, right? It doesn't store one more version of this file because it is the same version, right? The only thing that's got different is that it has the new entries. So that's how deduplication works. It never stores the same thing twice because it's the same, it has the same content. That's what is the meaning of content addressable. It is that the content itself serves as an address for an object. And if it's not changed, it's not changing. Okay, now let's, 
like our list keeps growing, let's just, you know, um, sort the number of, um, the current number of objects. And now let's um, do something more with our repository. Okay, let's create a branch and see what will happen. What kind of objects will appear. Okay, I want to work on the branch feature. I create the branch. Now let's move to this branch. Switch to the branch. Okay, now let's iterate the objects again and see if the count of objects changed. Well, surprisingly, it didn't change. As I said, the branches are not objects. When we create a branch, what happens is that we just um, we just create one more file that points just to the latest commits. It's, it's the same file. It's, it's basically the same commit, so there is no need to create anything new there. So refs adds feature is just a one more file. Okay, let's um, you know let's iterate over it. So. I said there are two of them, and just let's read files and compare. Boom, the feature and the master are the same. They point to the same file, but as I said, uh, branches are not objects. So they have, can have different name for the same stuff, basically. Okay, now let's actually do something in our uh, branch. Well, that's a familiar technique. Two more, I know something. Add. Well, we're sort of working on a feature here. Okay, now let's see if the branches change it. Boom. Okay, we can see that one of the branches are pointing now to a different commit. Well, because that's what we did. We added a new commit. And when you add a commit, it resets the, re the pointer of the branch to this newly created commit. You can see the old one didn't change, of course. Okay, now let's go back to master. And then let's emulate that something was in the meanwhile done in master. Oh, of course I didn't create the file first. Okay, um, let's edit it. Get Okay, now let's do what? Now we're gonna merge our, our feature branch into production. Okay, now we have a merge commit and my git offers me to write a text. Well, git generates for us automatic text, right, with this stuff. Okay, just let's, let, let's just use it. Okay, now let's investigate um, what is the current master uh, commit. What, what's what's special about it? Okay, I'm extracting the master pointer again, and let's plot the headers of the current master's commit. We see a bunch of familiar headers, but there is something new. There are two parents, and that's actually what makes a merge commit special. It has two parents, and because it's the parent commit that we were the previous branch and the commit from another branch. That basically, the ability to have several parents inside, inside the uh, commit is what makes git not a linked list, but a tree, and more specifically, a, a cyclic directed graph. Basically, it doesn't contain any more information. It doesn't even say in the headers what branch it was merged from. It just says the first commit and the second commit, and the contents are the file changes. Okay, that's uh, enough coding for today. Um, let's just do a small recap of what we learned. So file is a blob. It doesn't even have a name or, you know, any metadata. It's, it's, it's just a, well, just piece of a content. A tree is a list of blobs and trees. That, and tree, it's a recursive structure, right? It can point to files and other trees. And tree is the container of the metadata. It's implement the file storage level. Now, commit is, is it's a tuple of essentially three things. A snapshot of file system, which is implemented by linking to the 
three at that time, the parent commit hash or parents commit hashes, and some metadata like author and comment and that kind of stuff. So it uh, captures the file system changes. And branch itself is just a file, it's not an object, it's just a file that points to the last commit's hash. And uh, it's an important aspect that when git doesn't store uh, the full, uh, the git stores the full blob, so when you change the file, it stores the whole file again. That's why the checkouts are very fast, because it doesn't need to resolve deltas and all of the stuff, and it just gets filed by the hash immediately. That's why it's actually all this, um, you know, checkout branches and operations are that fast. So what is a merge? Merge is a special kind of, of commit with two parents. That's it. That's the only thing what m makes, a, you know, merge commit special. And that's what makes it not a linked list, but a tree. Okay, now I said that mutability has very important practical implications. And um, yeah, changes of content changes the hash, and the changes the hash means that linking is, gets broken. And it has a very practical aspect of it. History in Git is immutable as well, not just objects themselves. The history is immutable because history is based on content linking. So let's say we have this very, very simple history, right? That we have three commits, all the, those like two numbers is just uh, hashes, like very short version of hashes. And the master pointer branch points to 6b. Let's say we, we decided to change, ah, I'm, I just want to change a file in A4, right? Uh, or command, or basically anything in A4. So if we change something in A4, it is essentially becomes a new object with its own hash, right? And it will point to it's the same parent commit, 12. But since the content changes, it's a different object. And since git is content addressable, then 6b doesn't point to 7, F7 because it know nothing about it. Basically, at this stage, um, F7 is unreachable uh, commit. So if we want to change the history, we need to rewrite history in Git. So what we're going to do, we're going to create the commit that has the same stuff that 6b, but points as a parent points to 7, F7, right? It's the same content, but use a different parent. And then we can reset the master reference to our newly created 85 commit. And uh, basically, if we want to change history, we need to rewrite it, right? And then kill the previous one. But the reference cells, the branches, are actually mutable, and we can switch them later. So after that, we can write the run git gc, and it will uh, kill unreachable objects like a4 and 6b, or we can kill them manually because they are not unreachable. Well, I said that deltas are not really a part of, uh, well, Git, because if we change the object, even if it's large object, it will store uh, just two versions of the same object. There are no deltas. But that's actually part true. On a key value store, there are indeed, on the logical level, there are indeed no deltas. But it's quite inefficient, right, if you have a large file and you add just one line, just store the same thing twice. So Git this, has this trick, they have actually pack files with the deltas, uh, but they are not on logical levels, they are completely transparent to this key value storages. And yes, actually, if you run git jc, which stands for garbage collection, it will uh, pick up the similar stuff, and they do it heuristically, they don't, do deltas based on the, their relationship as a commit, as a history, they will just pick up similarly looking blobs, and they say, okay, this blob is based on this plus this line. Actually, it actually works quite fast. And otherwise, any large repository will be like unbelievably large. Okay, now we covered uh, the basics of Git internals and uh, I think, I hope you learn something and I hope it will provide you like a, fun, like a fundamentals to learn more, read more on the internet about Git internals. More things will be more clear for you. And uh, yeah, that's just the beginning I hope for you, for you learning the Git internals because there are ma many more interesting things, how files are sent over network, how deltas actually work and all that kind of stuff. I highly recommend the free and, uh, well, publicly accessible book, ProGit. It's official Git's book. 
Uh, it has the chapter about Git internals, which I used as the main source of inspiration. And thanks GitHub, I used their icons. Yeah, their license permits uh, non-commercial use of their icons. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. So do we have any questions? Was everything clear? Okay, oh, there's one question. Thank you very much for this nice journey through Git. Can you comment on how staging uh, is represented in this Git objects world? I knew, I knew. That's why I prepared a mini presentation on this as well. Okay, I will... I'll <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, the second thing that's like sort of mind-blogging for, for people who start with this. What the hell is this stage thing, right? And the worst part is that's called by three words that seemingly have nothing in common. Staging area is also known as index, also known as cache. So uh, it is intermediary between your file system and Git repository, which is used by uh, Git tooling. Why I honestly, I think one of the worst parts of Git, look, there are two commands. The first one will check out the branch with the name branch, and second command will purge all your changes, local changes, right? So the problem that Git seemingly does two completely unrelated things in two commands, um, but they're actually not that unrelated. So I think you, all of you have seen this diagram, right? You have this working tree if you want to you know, commit something. You first do git add uh, into staging area, then you do git commit and guess into repository. But this, this picture doesn't, diagram doesn't tell the whole story, right? Staging area is not something independent, something in between. So when you check out the branch, your staging area contains a cache of all the files in this branch, the cur their current versions, right? And when you change the file and do git add, what it does, it compares the contents of the file with the contents of the file in staging area, the cache, that's why it's called the cache. And if it sees there are differences, it moves the staged part of the files into this staging area, right? And when you do git commit, it go, goes all over the files that are marked as changed in the staging area. It's just a huge list of files, basically a tree of, of your changed things. And then it picks all the things that were changed and then creates a new tree from it. And then this tree goes into your commit. So basically when we do checkout dot, which purges everything, it basically means check out all the files from staging area into our working tree. And if we do checkout branch name, we say check out files from the branch. And in meanwhile, save the cache in the staging area. Okay, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for a great question. Yeah. For a great extra presentation. That was great. Anyone want to ask? Okay. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, should we think that stashing actually works the same way as uh, the staging? No, using, sorry, could you using repeat? Git stash, does it work the same way? Or well, no, nah, Git stash is something like completely on the side, right? It's just, uh, yeah, it has really nothing to do with basically the repository itself. D just Git stash, it says, okay, let's save those changes into, uh, you know, just a st stash file and that's it. It's, it's, it's actually not part of the, the, sor uh, the version control system. It's, it's just uh, basically, yeah, just, just like a like copy-paste area or something, just more, more, more advanced. It has really nothing to do with the version con versioning uh, at all. Thank you. Uh, so you, you basically mentioned that branches aren't objects, but if I remember cor correctly, uh, tags are objects. Uh, can you right. comment on that? Right, right, right. Um, yeah, indeed, I skipped this part because I think it's well, not that crucial for, for, you know, for a start. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there are actually two types of tags, like uh, called lightweight tags and the other ones. So lightweight tag is pretty much same as a branch. It's just a file with the name of the tag plus the commit that it points to. This is lightweight tag. And then there is, well, non-lightweight, I don't remember the exact name, I know, heavyweight tag. Uh, 
And yeah, annot thank you, annotated tag, right. So annotated tag is one more object type um, which uh, points to the commit that it's, 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 it tags, plus you can add a comment and a bunch of other metadata. And that kind of tag is an object and uh, as a result is, of course, immutable. Yeah, there are two types of tags that have nothing to do in common except that they both are called tags. <laughs> thank you. We have more questions. Um, thank you, and thank you for uh, discussing rewriting the history of Git. Is that something actually uh, you would recommend doing? Like, let's say you accidentally commit right. some bin large binary file, and it's always with you in Git yeah. history. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. It's something that I would not recommend doing at all, right? Because if you're the only user, right, if you reset your branches, if you're the only user, it's okay. But if you push this, then when other people pull, their new master has nothing to do with the old master, right? And then you will need to do Git uh, push hard, Right or force, I forgot the key. So yeah, it will in a collaborative environment. It will create a lot of issues. So yeah, you should try avoiding it at all costs. Uh, by the way, a small remark. So basically, because the uh, history is immutable, uh, it shares a lot of similarities with the technology blockchain that's used in, in uh, cryptocurrencies. Right, that uh, the block is uh, linked to its parent uh, block, and that's why if you cannot tamper with uh, all transactions because you can easily verify that you know hash doesn't match. So. That's one of the ideas, I think, one of the most intriguing ideas of Git. Thank you. Any more questions? We have time for like one or two more. There's okay. one in the front. Thank you. I understand how uh, master pointers, branch pointers works, but uh, how uh, it works when you write like head tilde to or had uh, some, some right, character. Right. It, it's a recursive uh, lookup in, in the tree or something like this? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Head is um, it's a, like a special uh, reserved reference so we can uh, see it. Yeah, it is a pretty much head. It's sort of like a branch but not really a branch. So we can uh, see it's just a file but not in the branches folder but just in the root folder. And basically head is a pointer to a current branch. And that's what is known by detached head, right? So uh, if I want to you know, check out a specific commit, I say do check out and the name of the commit, and then the head, instead of pointing to some branch, it will point specifically to this commit. So yeah, head of sort of like a reserved uh, branch name of, of source. It operates pretty much uh, yeah, similar fashion, but it's just not part of, of, of branches. Thank you. Yeah, we have questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation, very nice. Um, you mentioned something about uh, Git merge and how uh, uh, it's represented internally. Um, how does this compare the, with mm, Git tree base? Uh, sorry, what's compared to what? Uh, can you speak a little longer? Merge with the rebase. Oh, that's something I'm not going to touch. <laughs> I can, because I can, uh, you know, dedicate one more whole talk of the difference between merge and rebase. So uh, rebase, uh, okay, I'll try to do briefly. So merge is just a commit with uh, two parents and if Git, uh, Git automatically tries to merge it and if it cannot automatically merge, it will say, okay, sorry, but there are com uh, conflicts you need to resolve themselves. So how um, rebase works? Rebase basically replace, replace the changes in the other branch on top of the current br branch, right? So it, 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 it tries to see what changes, what deltas, like logical, that's the diffs that were in this branch. Then we will try to apply the same actions on the current branch. Uh, so yeah, it results the same. In, basically in the result you will have a commit containing the same information, but it's just, uh, but it will not have any information on its, basically all the rebase commits have one parent, right? It will result will be the, the same in terms of content, if there are no conflicts, of course. But in terms of structure, it will uh, all the rebased uh, commits have a single parent. But yeah, that's a really messy and complicated subject, and I personally don't even <laughs> like rebasing. Yes, okay, thank you so much.